evening. We are so glad that you are with us tonight. I trust that God has been blessing you in a very special way throughout this week and keeping you and your family safe as well. We continue tonight in our study from the book of Jeremiah. We're going to be looking at chapter 50 tonight. We're getting down to just the last two or three lessons in Jeremiah. We find in Jeremiah chapter 50 that Jeremiah specifically addresses the nation of Babylon. This is a prediction tonight. It's a prophecy of the fall of Babylon. We'll be talking about this throughout the evening tonight. Keep in mind that God had already used specifically the nation of Babylon to judge his people. That's what Jeremiah had said. That's what Jeremiah had prophesied would take place. Now, between chapters 50 and 51, if I counted correctly, there are 110 verses that talk about the prediction and fall of the city of Babylon and the nation of Babylon itself. Babylon, we've talked about before, is a modern-day Iraq. It's interesting, though, I believe, to see what the Bible says about Babylon and look at some of the things that have taken place over in Iraq. It's always amazing to me as well when I hear people from time to time say that they think the Bible is outdated. And yet we find here in Old Testament days, many, many years ago, things happened then that are so applicable for our own day and time. Now, sometimes the Bible prophecy, you have what is called a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. That means that sometimes a prophet will make a prediction, will make a prophecy that will have a fulfillment in the general time frame of that prophet's day, say 50 to 100 years, somewhere in that area. But you also find that sometime in these prophecies, you have what is called a far fulfillment. In other words, they are going to be fulfilled in years to come. And we find that here, especially in chapters 50 and 51. Some of the things that are predicted here take place around the general time of Jeremiah and his preaching. Other things evidently have not been fulfilled, and we probably won't see these fulfilled until the end of the age. When we read some of the things that uh, is predicted here in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, it seems like there are predictions that have already been fulfilled. We find parallels to this in Isaiah chapter 13. We find some of the predictions of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 13, we're told that are going to be fulfilled during the day of the Lord. That's the great tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period on this earth. We're also told that the city of Babylon, not only would it be in the day of the Lord, but we're told that it would not be inhibited again. We find that prediction right here in Jeremiah. Now, if those things are to be taken literally... That would indicate, I believe, to us that there will indeed be a rebuilding of the city of Babylon. If you remember, some of you may not have been born back in 1979. Remember our, our invasion, it took place a little bit later, but our invasion of Iraq and Saddam Hussein. In 1979, Saddam started rebuilding Babylon. He saw it as an ideal opportunity for a tourism explosion. He really did all he could to rebuild it. He identified himself with Nebuchadnezzar, that famous king of Babylon. He began to rebuild that city. He had bricks made. On those bricks, he had Nebuchadnezzar and Saddam Hussein. Well, we find in 1989... He even had a Babylon festival. They had all kinds of ceremonies, processions. That was all in the process already when the war in Iraq broke out. I believe we find indications that there will be a rebuilding of the city of Babylon. And we're going to touch on some of those things as we continue on this evening. I want us to see here, first of all, the Lord's vengeance. 
What we're going to find here in uh, chapter 50 is the Lord's judgment on Babylon. Now, God had used Babylon as an instrument to punish his own people. And yet now, God turns to Babylon and predicts that they are going to be judged as well. Chapter 50 and verse 15, the Bible sh says, Shout against her round about. She has given her hand, or in other words, she has surrendered. Her foundations are fallen, her walls are thrown down, for it is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance upon her as she hath done unto her. These verses here are basically teaching us that God is going to pour out his vengeance upon the city of Babylon. Look at verse 2 of chapter 50. Declare among the nations and publish and set up a standard or a signal. Publish and conceal not. Say Babylon is taken. There, right there, we have the prediction of the fall. The Bible says their bell is confounded. That was one of the Babylonian gods. Merodach is broken in pieces. That is another Babylonian god. Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. The literal Hebrew word that is used there or that is translated images is her dung pellets. This is Jeremiah's view of the pagan gods of Babylon. They are nothing but dung pellets. In the Bible, we find not only in the Old Testament Jeremiah uh, doing this, we also find Paul in the New Testament saying that all other gods except Jehovah, all other gods except the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are non-existent. And they're all demon gods. Think about it. All the gods that people serve today, other than the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All other gods are false gods today. We see this all over the world. In chapter 50 and verse 3, the Bible says, For out of the north there comes up a nation against her that may have had a, what we touched on earlier as a near fulfillment and none shall dwell in it. Go to chapter 50 and verse 13. We're going to be bouncing back and forth in chapter 50 tonight. Verse 13 says, Because of the wrath of the Lord, it, it is who? It's Babylon, talking about Babylon. It shall be not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. It does not seem that this prediction has ever come to pass. There's never been a time when Babylon has not been to some extent inhabited. Even today, there's a metropolitan center right on the edge of ancient Babylon. This may, we can't say for definitely, positively certain, or however you would like to word it, but this may be an indication to us there's, there's going to be a fulfillment later on. Look at verse 8. Remove out of the midst of Babylon. Now here is the call. Right here in verse 8, there's a call to come out of Babylon. He expands on it in verse 11, saying why you need to do it. Verse 11 says, because ye were glad. He's talking here of why he was going to judge Babylon. Because ye were glad. Because ye rejoiced. O ye destroyers of my heritage. Because ye are grown fat like the heifer at grass. And bellow like bulls. He's just simply saying here, the reason that I am judging you is because you took pleasure in what you did to my chosen people. In the midst here now of talking about the destruction of Babylon, he also talks about the return of the children of Israel to their land. Look at verse 4. In those days and in that time, evidently now we're talking about the end times, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. They will ultimately return back to the land of Israel. May 14, 1948, Israel has become a nation. There has been a return to some extent, but largely it's been a return of unbelief. Verse 5, they shall ask the way to Zion. 
there will be once again a great return in the end times. And they will say, come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant. There seems to be an indication that there's going to be a spiritual return one day to the land. Verse 20, in those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for. And there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. That just simply means that God is going to forgive the nation of Israel. When God forgives, the Bible says that he forgets. The Bible says that he covers all of our sins. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34, the Lord says, For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. That's exactly what God does with our sins today. When we come to the Lord and ask Him to forgive us of our sins, He wipes our slate clean. Even as believers, we are not perfect. We all sin on a daily basis. But still, when we ask God to forgive us of our sins and we mean it, He wipes our slate completely clean. When God then looks at you and me, isn't it great? that he sees us in Christ. Having our sins forgiven, we are now in him. Our sins are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and held against us no more. When God looks at you and me, then he sees us in Christ. But sometimes, if we'll be honest, I believe we feel so guilty even after we ask the Lord, to forgive us of whatever sin that we may have committed. We feel guilty, and so many times we beat up ourselves because of our own sins. I believe if we look at it practically, it's like we're beating ourselves up because of our sin that we've asked Jesus to forgive us of, and it's like Jesus is saying, what sin are you talking about? Your slate has been wiped clean. Isn't it so great this evening to know that when God forgives our sins, He doesn't rub it in. He rubs it off, takes it away completely. And now we see the Lord's dominance. In chapter 20 of Jeremiah, beginning with verse 25, he talks about the fact that God will go to war against ancient Babylon. Verse 25, the Lord has opened up His armory and has brought forth the weapons of His indignation for this is the work of the Lord. Literally, he's saying right here, the sovereign Lord, the sovereign Lord has a mighty work to do. The Lord God Almighty is going to work against the nation of Babylon. He talks here about the weapons of our indignation. In verse 20. Eight, he talks about the vengeance of his temple. We find this cross-referenced here in Daniel chapter 5, the first four verses. Then he begins to name the different weapons of this warfare. In verse 29, he talks about the archer who bends the bow. He says in verse 30, Therefore shall her young men fall in the streets, and all her men of war shall be cut off. And God says in verse 31, Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud. He's saying, O arrogant one. And was Babylon ever proud of what they had done? You look back at Saddam Hussein. He had many palaces. He thought he was inconvincible. But God brought him down. There's a principle in the Bible that is literally unchanging in nature. The principle that says pride goes before destruction in a haughty spirit before a fall. It caused Satan to fall from heaven. It causes leaders of the world to fall. If we're not careful, it will cause you and me to fall as well. We need to stay humble before the Lord. Never be arrogant. Never be proud. Look what I have done when God has been doing it all for us. In chapter 50, 
verses 35, 36, and 37, you have a little bit of repetition here. Five times it says a sword. Five times. It talks about how the sword is going to be used. Verse 38, he talks about a drought. Verse 42, he talks about the bow and the lance again. He goes all through these verses talking about the Lord's dominance. The Lord will declare war. The Lord will bring about justice. It will be a battle that the Lord himself will lead against Babylon. Jeremiah, what's Jeremiah got to do with all this? He's been preaching. He's been prophesying. We don't know for sure what happened to Jeremiah. Tradition says that eventually he was taken down to Egypt and died there. All we can do is speculate on that. But let's think about Jeremiah just for a moment. We've gone over a bunch of stuff here now in chapter 50, but what does it all boil down to? Jeremiah, for 40 years, 40 years, he preached and got no response. Think about that just for, for a minute. He knew that God called him to preach. God called him to be a prophet. God told him from the get-go it would not be easy, but for 40 years he preached and nothing happened. He was put in jail. He was threatened. He was rejected. He was called a traitor. People accused him of being unpatriotic. I don't know. Once again, all we can do is speculate but perhaps Jeremiah died alone. Who knows? Maybe Jeremiah died feeling like a failure. If he did, I can almost imagine when Jeremiah awoke going through the gates of glory, there in heaven in the presence of the Lord, I can hear the Lord saying to Jeremiah, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You say, okay, that was then, this is now. What does all of this have to do with me tonight? Well, four things I want us to see. Number one, God always has a word for the day. No matter what the world situation may look like, God is still on the throne. God is still large and in charge. And God still has a word for all of us today. Number two, God wants someone to carry the word. It may be the Lord might be calling some of you into the ministry. In essence, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we know that in one sense of the word, we are all in the ministry. God needs people. God needs his people. God needs believers to carry his word. God needs people to, to go and tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our job as believers on a daily basis. Wherever we are at, whatever opportunity, we say here at the church all the time, ask God to give you someone today to talk to about Jesus. If you pray that prayer and mean it, you will get somebody during the day, if you keep your spiritual eyes open, that you will be able to talk to. God needs someone today to carry his word. It doesn't mean that everything is always going to be great. It doesn't mean that everyone's always going to be receptive of the word that you give them. But it does mean that God's going to be with you each and every step of the way. And number three, remember that God does not call us to be successful, but God calls us to be faithful. Oh, it's great to be successful. I believe if we are faithful, God's going to bless us in his very own, very special way. But just remember, be faithful in all that you do. Be faithful to him. Be faithful to his word. Be faithful to his church. Do not neglect the assembling of believers together. And number four, no matter what may come your way, God's ultimate goal for your life, God's ultimate goal for my life, is that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. 
yes, we're not going to be perfect like he was. But as we strive to serve him to the best of our ability, as we remain faithful to him, as we carry his word out, as we, as we remember that he wants nothing but the best for us, as we stay in his word, it will draw us closer to Jesus. And as we are drawn closer to Jesus, we in turn will be more like him. Father, help us to be more like you in all that we do. Oh, we realize some may be watching, listening tonight, or may be going through some of the toughest times in their lives. Lord, just wrap your arms around them. Let, you know, let them know that you still love them, that you care for them. Lord, help us to draw all of our strength from you in all that we do. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, thank you once again so much for joining us tonight. I trust that you'll have a great rest of the week. If you do not have a church that you are actively involved in, we would love for you to come and visit us at Temple Church. Our Sunday morning services during this COVID virus is at 9 and at 1030. If you're not able to join us in our live service, if you still feel uncomfortable in, in getting out, that is fine. Join us online at 1030 on Sunday mornings. May God bless you. We love you. And hopefully we'll see you Sunday.